All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us again for another one of our chatting with NDS Paleo. Uh, we should maybe change the name to chatting with NDGS Paleo and friends uh, as we're bringing in more and more guest speakers. Um, but just for anyone, if anyone's new, uh, my name is Clint Boyd. I'm the senior paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. Uh, we also have with us today uh, Becky Barnes, lab manager for the survey, uh, who is the host for this. Um, as well as Jeff Person, our collections manager is here. Um, but joining us today for our special talk are Ashley Hall and Lee Hall, who are gonna be talking about, and I'm gonna say this wrong, but Dunkleosteus, is that right? Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus, see, I told you I was gonna say it wrong. <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> so they are joining us from Ohio, if I still remember where Cleveland is. Um, Good job. <laughs> So Ashley currently works as the marketing coordinator at the Nature Sh Center at Shaker Lakes. Um, she previously was an assistant curator of paleontology out at the ALF Museum in California, and she got her bachelor's degree from Indiana University Bloomington. Uh, Lee Hall works for the Cleveland Museum of Natural History as a fossil preparator, so he does what Becky does for us at the Cleveland Museum. Uh, and he got his bachelor's degree from Montana State University. So they have been gracious enough to join us today and talk about a really great creature that I think you're all gonna like. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley and Lee. Thanks guys. Awesome, well, good morning and thanks so much for having us. Hello from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, as you can see behind us, we've got a very exciting animal to talk to you about today. This is Dunkel Osteus and <laughs> And we have, um, we have an amazing, like I said, animal to talk to you guys about today. So um, without further ado, we will start our screen sharing because you can't have a talk about Dunkleosteus without some really great images. This is an animal that lived um, 360 million years ago. And so I wanna know how many of you think that Dunkleosteus, this animal behind us, is a dinosaur. What do you think? When you think of what a dinosaur is, do you think of Dunkleosteus? Do you think of like, what do you think? Is it a dinosaur, another animal? Throw up your answers there. All right, think about that for a minute. Think about what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. All right. I always thought it was a kind of sea kelp. <laughs> Dunkleosteus lived, here's your first clue, in the Devonian period, at the very end of the, of the Devonian. Now, the major um, eras of life history are broken up into three segments. We have the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic is when mammals really came into their prime and sort of took over the dominant terrestrial or land-dwelling animals on the planet. And in the Paleozoic, we had the evolution of animals like invertebrates and plants, um, fishes, and the earliest amphibians and reptiles. And uh, in the Mesozoic, we have the evolution of animals like mammals and birds and dinosaurs. So Dunkleosteus lived towards the latter part of the Paleozoic about 359 million years ago, plus or minus you know, a few million years on either end. In Ohio, where Ashley and I live, we have a species of Dunkleosteus known as Dunkleosteus terrelli. There are actually several different species of Dunkleosteus thought to have existed. Um, but the best fossils of Dunkleosteus terrelli come from right here in Northeast Ohio. Which and we'll talk amazing. about and show where that actually is, because when you think about Ohio, you probably, well, if you haven't been here, it's basically like North Dakota, right, or any other state that's kind of Midwestern. We've got, um, you know, grasses and cities and schools and all those sorts of things, but you don't often think of it being covered by ocean. We've got Great Lakes now that were left by the Ice Age, by the glaciers, but you don't think of there being an ocean, which is really, really so in this picture, you guys can see there is Dunkleosteus that is swimming next to a shark in the foreground. That shark is called Cladosalaki. That's a really fun word. You guys can all say Cladosalaki. Um, and what that's a, a little that shark. Means? What is, what is a, a name like that is so much of a mouthful. And 
there's actually a, a whole um, reason that, that it has that name. It's a scientific name and all animals and organisms on earth have a scientific name that is usually derived from meanings in ancient Greek and Latin or maybe local cultural or geographical references. Platysalaki actually translates into branched shark. Now it doesn't look like a tree branch and that's not why it's called that. It actually has to deal with the teeth. Um, so Cladosalaki's teeth don't look like big triangle knives, kind of like Megalodon or great white sharks. A lot of modern sharks have these very triangular teeth. Cladosalaki teeth actually looks kind of like a, a fork and they had three big spikes. So this is a Cladosalaki <laughs> mouth had these teeth with three big spikes and two little spikes in between. It's all about the teeth in that case, the branch teeth. Right, so when we think about an animal like a bald eagle, that's a common name. And um, when you think about a scientific name, we don't call a bald eagle, you know, its scientific name. We usually just call it its common name. So I don't know what Dunkleosteus' common name would have been if it was alive today, but I don't know. What do you guys think he would have called a Dunkleosteus if we could call it something? Hmm. We usually call things what they're like, what they look like. Mm -hmm. Right, so bald eagle, uh, red uh, headed woodpecker. I don't know, maybe it'd be like chompy mouthed beast or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I like the German, the German term Panzer, Panzerfisch. So it's like a tank fish. Yeah. And that gives away the answer um, to our quiz. So Dunkleosteus, is it a dinosaur? No, it's not. It's a fish. Obviously, you just saw it swimming in the water. Um, so here is a map of North America, and that star is where Ashley and I live in Cleveland, Ohio. And you'll see the red line there to the left is the equator back in the Devonian. So once upon a time, the North American continent was actually south of the equator. It has moved north since then. And it was also flooded. It's actually been flooded several times by several different seas throughout its history. But at this time, Dunkleosteus would have been living in that shallow sea and swimming around um, North America. We have some Where of the North best. North Dakota, there. Can you see North Dakota, Dakota is is North Dakota is just west of that island. So if you go to the left of the star, across the red line, there's kind of a big mm -hmm. island. And then just the left of that, you can see North Dakota hanging out. So North Dakota was actually, there was land there at the time. That's South Dakota. Where, where? This is North Dakota. Yeah, right it was like Canada. right yeah. off of right. the, it's like coastal. Yeah, so uh, like Ohio. And Dunkleosteus probably was swimming over North Dakota too. It's just that modern geology has exposed the Dunkleosteus fossil rocks here in Ohio and yours are still buried underneath all those cool dinosaurs and fossils. So this is, this is the greater Cleveland area and that's Lake Erie uh, of the north and we've just outlined the county in which we live. Yeah, it's really important to know that that is not an ocean, even though it looks so big and so blue, that is one of the great lakes, that's mm -hmm. Lake Erie. And the blue that we just outlined inside the green zone is all of the the Devonian rock called the Cleveland Shale that's exposed around Cleveland. And those are the rocks where you find Dunkleosteus fossils. And really important to note, actually in Ohio, we do not find any dinosaur fossils because um, at the time, like you just saw, it was covered up by ocean. But even after that, we really didn't have any dinosaur fossils being deposited. Oh, wait, so is it time for our next poll? We've got another poll, I think, Clint. So our next um, poll was, which is older, um, dinosaurs or Dunkleosteus? <laughs> so if you guys think which is older, I may have given you a little bit of a hint just now, but which is older, dinosaurs or Dunkleosteus? Oh, no. Hmm. So the yellow star in this picture is where one of our very best Dunkleosteus skulls was found back in the 1920s. And it was found along the banks of the Rocky River. All of the fossils we find in Ohio, we have to go look in the river valleys along cliffs and ledges because the city is built up on top of the surface everywhere else. 
So we don't have a lot of natural erosion happening except for in the rivers and stream valleys. Those are the best places for us to find Dunkleosteus. And if you said Dunkleosteus is older than dinosaurs, you are right. So it's 360 million years old and dinosaurs evolved about 220 to 240 million years ago. So Dunkleosteus is actually older than dinosaurs. So in Ohio, we have very, very, very old fish fossils, some of the oldest vertebrates on Earth. And I can see that we have a very smart audience. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be very good at tricking you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we're looking at here is the Dunkleosteus skull that was found at Rocky River here in Ohio. Look at those teeth. That's amazing. Oh my teeth? gosh. I don't know. Are they teeth? Tell us. We're, there's actually a, this debate about whether or not those chompy things in Dunkleosteus' mouth are actual true teeth or not. So they... One thing is for certain, they don't look like the teeth that are in our mouths. They don't sit in sockets, but there are scientists who are pretty convinced that they are uh, teeth of some kind. There are some scientists who are not quite as convinced. So it's still under investigation. It doesn't necessarily mean anyone's very right or wrong. It's yeah. just that we don't have enough information to completely understand it yet. And if you guys smile and look at your own teeth, if you take your tongue and feel your teeth, I uh, guess, they can feel how smooth and shiny they are. They're covered with a material called enamel. And Dunkleosteus did not have any enamel, the shiny hard stuff that makes our teeth so strong on the outside of its chompers. But it did have something called dentine or semi-dentine. And underneath our enamel is the dentine. And if you have ever had the dentist mess with your dentine, usually that doesn't feel very good because dentine can is where you start to feel stuff. But uh, Dunkleosteus probably didn't have that issue. Those jaw blades or dental plates as I like to call them grew continuously throughout the life of Dunkleosteus. So if you've heard of rodents needing to gnaw on wood or bone in order to keep their teeth trimmed, Dunkleosteus kept its jaws trimmed just by opening and closing its mouth just like that. <laughs> So as you can see, those jaw blades sharpened as they rubbed against one another, just like a knife on a whetstone, which kept them razor sharp. Even the fossils are almost sharp enough to cut yourself. And the polish can be so fine that you can almost see your reflection in them sometimes. We should probably really quickly talk about a couple of the big things about the skull. So yeah. um, the eye. Yeah, what's going on? the eye. There's like a bone inside of the eye. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, Dunkleosteus belongs to a group of fish called placoderms, but the nickname is they're called armored fish. Mm -hmm. And is it really armor? You know, in some cases, yes, it's, it's very much looks like an external bony plate, but you are looking at the skull of Dunkleosteus. Can you guys still see me or am I disappearing when I hold things? Disappear. I don't know if break <laughs> up. <It's, laughs> There we go. Oh my God. <laughs> so um, a lot of times in toys and models, it makes it look like the skull bones are on the outside of the head, which is really, excuse me, weird. Now, Dunkleosteus didn't have a lot of muscle and fat outside of its skull, but those bones would have been covered in skin. And then, you know, how much of the detail of the individual bones we could have seen, we don't really know. But they did not have the bones on the outside of their head with another skull inside or something weird like that. And the bone in the eye was not external. That was inside of the tissue of the eye to, to basically keep the eye's shape stable as it swam through different pressures and water depths. Yeah, when we think about armor, we think of something on the outside, but Dunkleosteus' bones were definitely on the inside underneath its skin. And this is what Dunkleosteus looked like when it was eaten. So <laughs> it had a special joint at the back of its skull. It's not actually missing a bone, that hole right. that you see. Back there. That hole at the top of the skull is actually room so that the upper jaws can move and allow the skull and the mouth to open really, really big, to take big bites. This one doesn't, I'm disappointed this toy doesn't do that. <laughs> I just realized that this toy has gills on the side, which is cool, but not on the, you can see the hole on the top, but they did include that, which is good. Yes, some of our older audience members will recognize Pac-Man and um, not, but not that old. And plaque man is just a play on words because uh, Dunkleosteus is a placoderm fish, and I thought I was being very clever. You're so smart. I know. 
So look at that. So there's Dunkelosti is swimming in the water. And as you can see, those other fish are trying to keep their distance. And we're actually going to talk a little bit about some of the animals that used to live with Dunkelosteus in the Devonian Ocean. So uh, one of the other really interesting things about Dunkelosteus and the placoderm fish is that uh, we think that they may have given live birth. There's evidence that the, from other related animals that they actually um, may have given live birth like you see depicted here. And it looks like some kind of a gnarly paleoniscoid fish or two is hanging out looking for a vulnerable baby Dunkelosteus. However, you wouldn't want to get too close to even a newborn Dunkelosteus because even in the smallest specimens we have with heads the size of grapefruits, the jaws could still, they take your finger off, no problem, like yeah. a snapping turtle. And it's really important to note too that um, Dunkelosteus is an early, early vertebrate. So when we think of animals evolving, we think, you know, way, way, way back. So 400 million years ago, you know, the only things that were around were invertebrates like trilobites. If you guys know what trilobites are, one of the coolest invertebrate fossils. Um, there were different animals in the sea like um, squid and also um, lots and lots of fish, but there was nothing on land yet. Land was really um, unexplored um, until 300 and... About, about right? the time Dunkelosteus, yeah, when Dunkelosteus was in the oceans, yeah. that's when you have your first sort of amphibian-ish like animals that are exploring the Tictolic. land. Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit about Cladosalaki. I think we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll go ahead and progress through. Um, we find sharks here in Cleveland, and we have a really rare set of photographs here that actually show the discovery of a shark fossil. Uh, of Cladosalaki back in the 1920s when they were working around a stream bed called Big Creek. So in this picture, the bucket of an electric shovel or steam shovel uh, has hooked what they call a concretion, which is a big pancaked shaped piece of rock the size of a coffee table. You can see it circled in red there. And they dug it out and flipped it up on its side and usually concretions are much harder than the rock around. No, wait, this is, this is really interesting. When we think paleontology, we think of paleontologists as little brushes, kind of being really, really careful. So why are they using these giant machines? Yeah, it's, it's a, so it's obviously different than a dinosaur dig, but in this case, uh, the city was trying to redirect a creek and they were trying to engineer the the creek's path, so they brought out the big construction equipment and started digging and moving the creek bed around. And this rock is the rock where you find fossils of Dunkelosteus and you find fossil sharks inside of these big concretion nodules. And so this is what we're looking at happening here. So they, they pull the concretion out of the bank, out of the shale pile, and there's an early paleontologist named Peter Bungart from the Cleveland Museum, and he's using a hammer and chisel to start cracking the rock open as everyone looks on, wondering what this guy is so what interested in. Inside. And lo and behold, there he is with a couple of the other um, construction staff. And there is a shark. You can see those are the two, <laughs> those are the two pet coral fins of the shark there. And the one gentleman looks like he just can't believe what he's seeing. He doesn't, he doesn't look too thrilled. So I just like to, I like to make him happy. <laughs> you know, remember at the time, people didn't realize that these, um, like the significance of these fossils, you know, mm -hmm. they thought that they were, they were really amazing, but, you know, now we know them as the best and oldest shark fossils pretty much anywhere in the world. They're, as far as complete fossils, yeah, because you have stomach contents and soft tissues and muscles and skin. In the next slide. And we're actually going to show you an example of that. So here is what one of these fossil sharks looks like today. You guys can see the head um, towards the left and then mm -hmm. the fins, it's kind of laying belly side up. Yeah, you're looking at the tummy. And if you look at the area, we don't have the end of the tail, but you look at the tummy area, there's kind of a weird shape, like yeah. right in the middle. Of, like what could that bumbling, be? Right in the center. Tippling. Let's take a closer now, look. If you look closely, that's actually three fish that were in that shark's stomach. And they were all lined up head to tail the same direction as the shark, meaning the shark had chased these little fish down and swallowed them tail first. And it got three of them and then very shortly after died. And we know that it died soon after it ate them because the fish aren't digestive, they're in perfect condition. 
So you can it's see a bad fish dinner. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess <laughs> maybe you needed some tartar sauce or something <laughs> that would cut out. So it's hard to say why you know the shark died, even when we have really perfectly preserved fossils, we still have all these mysteries. But um, these little paleoniscoid fish are some of the best examples of, of early bony fish, which are pretty familiar to most people today. You know, these are the fish from the Devonian. You'd look at them and say, oh, that looks kind of like fish that we're used to seeing, you know, this day and age, a third of a billion years seeing later. Seeing or catching or eating, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then you guys can see the scale detail in the picture. Um, all those little scales are still preserved too. One of the other big fish at the time, possibly bigger than Nuncolosteus, was Titanichthys. Here's a beautiful piece of artwork by a paleontologist and artist Mark Whitten. So there were many different kinds of these uh, placoderm fish, and Titanichthys was actually thought to be a filter feeder because its jaws didn't have the big chompy bits, no blades or crushing implements or anything like that. So. So when we think about a Devonian ocean 350 million years ago, 360 million years ago, you think about um, sort of Dunkleosteus, there were sharks around, there were these big filter feeders. And so thinking about the oceans today, we have sharks, we have fish, um, we do have big filter feeders like um, uh, whale sharks. Um, so the same niches, right, when you think about a habitat, those niches of different levels of where animals are living in the ocean and what they're eating, um, those were very similar to even 360 million years ago um, as they are today. So that's really cool. And that's an important point to notice. A lot of times when we, when we learn about fossil animals and extinct animals, we think of them as primitive or early failures that were just leading up to, you know, modern biodiversity. And somehow modern biodiversity is, is, is better than the biodiversity of the past. But really, um, when you really get to know fossils, you understand that the Earth has, for, for most of its existence, been extremely biodiverse once vertebrates really, you know, took off. Yeah. So the late Devonian was, was just as rich in diversity and wonderful, amazing life forms uh, as the Earth is today. And sometimes events occur that even the, the healthiest animals and healthiest ecosystems just can't handle and recover from, and that leads to the big extinction. Also important to note that Megalodon, which you guys probably are all familiar with, did not live during this time. So there's a lot of depictions sometimes that are incorrect when you have Dunkleosteus living at the same time in a, in a drawn image with Megalodon and Mosasaurus and other animals that lived in totally separate time periods. So um, Megalodon only lived a couple million years ago. It really wasn't that long ago compared to Dunkleosteus. Mm -hmm. So this, this animal was one of the top or the top predator in the ocean at the time. But Megalodon is extinct. It's dead. It's not <laughs> living at the bottom of the ocean. I wish it was. Some of the other fossils that we find, not just fish, um, but we do find plant fossils. So this is uh, about a three foot tall club moss which is called Clevelandodendron ohioensis. I wonder where that one was found, but you can just see some of the neat details from the fossil here. So in the shale, we actually find land plants as well that floated out, they fell into a river and were washed out to sea and sank over ancient Cleve. Yeah, so even though there were no animals really at the time on land that we would know of or recognize today, there were a lot of amazing plants and plants that would look very strange to us. They, don't, they do not look like plants that we have around. So um, in the last couple of minutes here, how are we doing on time, everybody? Yep. Okay. So we want to talk about what we can learn from the fossils that we find here. So what do you do if you have all these amazing fossils and you find hundreds of Dunkleosteus bones and dozens of sharks and things like that? So we're going to look at an example of a, a little research study uh, that we, you know, we've done at the museum. And this is a diagram of a Dunkleosteus skull. And I want everyone to look at the bone in the center of the picture. That, that bone is called the suborbital kind of bone. It's cheekbone there. It's a cheekbone. And we're going to look at some pictures of, uh, of, of a cheekbone that has some really interesting stuff going on. Right there. OK, so <laughs> in this cheekbone of Dunkleosteus, um, this is one example where you can see there's a lot of markings, red markings. And each one of those red markings is circling a bite mark. And that big red area at the right side is actually the part of that bone that's missing. There should be a really big, big flat flange of bone 
but unfortunately it's not there. And if you look at those bite marks, they all seem to end at the broken edge of the fossil. So when we started looking at other duncal osseous fossils, we've actually found lots of bite marks on this bone and other bones in that region of the skull, which would have been behind the jaws around where the gill arches were. So wait, does that mean something, what's happening with the bite marks then? Some, well, how do you get bite marks on something? I mean, if, if you bite it, if you find a book, if you open a hamburger wrapper and there is a chunk taken out of your hamburger, if you see a bite mark in your hamburger, what happens? Some, somebody, somebody took a bite out of it. Somebody took a bite out of it. Yeah. It wasn't you. And in this case, you're seeing the same thing in the fossils of Dunkelostia. So we think that Dunkelostia was, uh, they were biting each other in the face, either as a territorial dispute or some kind of maybe mating dispute, yeah. or maybe maybe they were eating each other. I mean, animals today will often eat one another. I mean, mm -hmm. fish do all the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, but with Duncal Osteus, you know, we don't exactly know their biology. They lived so long ago. We don't, you know, there's no comparable thing that we can say, yeah, this is kind of like, you know, you just can't. Dunkleosteus is so different, and so let's um, do a. This is a, a reconstruction here, okay? <laughs> so just like, just like that. I don't know. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. <laughs> anyway, you can imagine the one Dunkleosteus yeah. coming down and chomping on the other one. Um, so we actually have um, big Dunkleosteus skulls with big bite marks in them, and and about the only fish that was around. That could put that kind of damage into the the big bones of those skulls were probably other duncal osteus. We also have baby duncal osteus skulls that are crushed just like um, someone stepped on, a, on an egg and that is damage you don't see done just from settling to the bottom of a quiet seabed. So it's a really interesting fossil collection, fossil deposit at the, in the Cleveland Shale and we're really happy to be able to have the time to share some of this information with all of you today. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add? Um, if anyone ever visits Cleveland, Ohio, please visit the Cleveland Museum of Natural History because right here in Cleveland, we have the best Uncle Osteus fossils in the entire world. So they were found right here. You can even go visit the site they were found. It's the Rocky River Nature Center in Rocky River, Ohio. And it's about 30 minutes drive from Cleveland. So. Go visit the site, visit the fossils at the museum, and uh, learn more about Duncal Osteus. Yeah, and you know, we're always sharing Duncal Osteus facts on uh, the museum's Twitter, um, at GoCMNH, and the Vert Paleo Twitter, which is at CMNH Vert Paleo, and of course, Lady Naturalist over here, uh, and Paleo Guy myself on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, cool, thanks everybody. Our, our first question is, how many species of Dunkelosteus are there? I have seen um, up, to, up to 11 suggested, but I don't know how reliable that is because the, so there are two places on, um, on Earth where you find really, really good Dunkelosteus fossils. Dunkelosteus terrelli from Cleveland, Ohio, and then Dunkelosteus marsazi from Morocco and Africa. Um, which is also a really, really fantastic fossil deposit. Um, in different basins uh, around North America, you can find fragmentary Dunkelosteus material. Uh, so, you know, this includes Canada, pieces have been found potentially in California, but you also get them in places like Poland. So there are bits and pieces and um, there's a maximum of about 11, but I don't, I don't know if I would go quite that high. Oh, and it's important to note too that uh, Duncal Osteus cast, um, the cast skull like we were showing, it's actually behind us right here um, in our backdrop. That's a cast of the Cleveland Museum specimen that can be found pretty much all over the world. Um, it was cast, what, 70, 80 times, wasn't it? A lot. Um, yeah. And it can so, be found all over the world. Um, oh gosh, Paris, uh, the Royal Terrell Museum, uh, Pittsburgh, Chicago. Uh, Chicago. So it's everywhere. But we have the original. Mm -hmm. But the two, the two best uh, known species are, are Terrelli and Marsazi. 
Did it ambush or did it chase its prey? Um, so answering questions like that is kind of difficult based on fossil evidence alone, but one thing that you can use to make an inference is to look at modern animals in a similar um, ecosystem. Yep. And so um, it's been compared to basically the, you know, being like the great white shark of the day, one of the apex predators, if not the apex predator in the ocean at the time. Um, judging, you know, based on the bite mark evidence we see on the fossils, you know, and again, we don't have like soft tissue for Dunkleosteus, mm -hmm. sort of the skin and the outside of the body behind the skull, but we're seeing them attacking the skulls of other animals from the side behind the jaws. So that seems to be a rather indirect um, confrontation. So that, yeah. that seems to be maybe more of an ambush style of, of predation. If you look at a Dunkleosteus skull as well, the eyes are situated, because um, the skull's kind of curved, and the eyes are situated sort of forward and facing upward just a little bit, which seems like it would give them sort of a good field of vision ahead of also their path and, and above. Yeah, seeing yeah. fish from a little bit higher above them if they're swimming and, and ambushing and going up to, to actually attack their prey. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, we, we did know that they have they have very strong muscles and, um, and their tail. And um, uh, it's really interesting to note too that, um, as you noticed, we have gut contents for sharks, we have um, skin, we have muscle um, fibers, we have everything in the body that's actually very well preserved, the skin, everything in sharks. But we don't have that for Dunkleosteus. We have a few bones past the skull but the only thing that's ever been found from Dunkleosteus is the head. So we don't exactly know why that is. I think it's been hypothesized that um, sharks have a certain amount of a chemical called urea inside of them. And it's possible that that was acting as a pickling agent and helping their skin and muscle and everything stay preserved, whereas Dunkleosteus may not have had that. Yeah, we do have a little bit of, of what we call post-cranial material from Dunkleosteus in the collection of Cleveland uh, cartilage from the pectoral fins and maybe the pelvic area, uh, a few vertebrae, very, very rare, very right. hard to find. So it's important to note when you see an animal like Dunkleosteus that we know doesn't have, um, you know, all we have is the skull, anything behind here is basically, um, uh, we look at their relatives, who they're related to, what their um, uh, closest, you know, uh, what is it, Cacosteus is the, closest, is the yeah. closest fish that we can compare it to that it's related to. So we don't exactly know it has this exact shape of tail yeah. fin or pectoral fins or... That's why we have, we have three Dunkleosteus here, <laughs> the one behind us, and these two, and they all have different tails yeah. and fins and things. It's all kind of up to artists right now, so mm -hmm. um, it's it's kind of fun that way because you can think about what you you know what you think Dunkleosteus's color might have been um, being such a, a large predator. The animal behind us, the model at the Rocky River Nature Center behind Lee, um, you can see kind of was painted to look a little bit like a tiger shark. So maybe kind of going with a more camouflaged approach to its environment and reflecting the the um, uh, sun, the sunlight filtering down through the water and giving it sort of like a, a hidden camouflage. Mm -hmm. Or I guess camouflage is hidden, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. What is questions? the biggest Dunkleosteus skull ever found? Oh, the biggest Dunkleosteus skull ever found. So, um, to my knowledge, the largest complete Dunkleosteus skull is the one found at Rocky River uh, that's on display at the wow. Natural History Museum. But in our collection, we actually have fragments of Dunkleosteus skulls that would have been far larger. Um, so if, if we use some rough math and extrapolate, the, the skull behind, between Ashley and I, uh, that big skull is about five feet long, um, a little over five feet. And we have bones of, of parts of the jaws and things from skulls that would have been probably uh, maybe six and a half feet long. So, and that's just the, the skull and the trunk armor. So that's an estimated length, but 
Yeah, they're absolutely huge. The jaws are, when they get that big, the, the jaw blades themselves are almost the size of like a big, like a, almost a pizza. And, and, it's just the and jaw heavy. Blade. They're, they're not light. They're, they're dense bones. Yeah, if you turn them, if you turn them on end, they're, the jaw blades are about yay tall. So we're looking at like, I don't know, 10 to 12 inches. Well, not, uh, yeah, about 10 inches. And yeah. then they're uh, three or four inches thick. So they were really, really massive. And just to get some scale, I'll send you guys a picture of me next to one because it's it's something to see a picture of a skull, but then when you see a human next to it, it really takes it to the next level. So and yeah, um, maximum length for gunkel osteus because we don't have all the stuff behind the skull is up for you know some debate, but we're definitely talking the 20, 25 foot range at least. I don't know about anything over 30 <laughs> feet, but that's still huge. You know, it's great white and shark size, if not a little bigger. <laughs> Did they ever break their teeth? Ooh, good question. Mm -hmm. Have you found any teeth in collections with broken? You know, um, I'm okay. sure they must have fractured them at some point, but you know, and that, that might explain why we have um, some diversity in sort of the, the shapes of those jaw blades. Some of them are a little more um, curved, and some of them are a little less curved. Well, they so, sharpen them all the time, so if they did yeah, break part of them off. Yeah, so there's some individual variation in the shapes of those jaw blades, but we haven't found any, any indication of, of something broken or snapped off. You know, we do have some jaw bones that have evidence of disease or pathology on them, but it doesn't really affect the, the fangs or the jaw blades. So as of yet, to my knowledge, we have not discovered any, any broken um, jaw. And it seems blade. like, too, with a lot of predators, um, you know, a, apart from saber-toothed cats, looking at you, Clint, um, there are animals that can replace their teeth all the time that are these big top predators, right? So you have sharks, um, theropod dinosaurs, um, crocodiles. Oh, my gosh, like the list goes on and on. But when it comes to some of the more specialized carnivorans, um, like saber-toothed cats, they have to be really, really careful because yeah. they don't replace those big ones. When it comes to teeth, it, it stinks to be a mammal. Yeah, <laughs> you would know. He's got his, his teeth worked on the other day, and mm -hmm. boy, we, we wish we could replace our teeth, don't we? Mm -hmm. uh, a geology question here. Uh, on the photo with the concretions, how did those concretions get their shape? Ooh. Well, that's a good question. Okay. Concretions can take a variety of shapes depending on the geologic formation you're in. Sometimes they can be weird little wiggly clusters of lumps. Sometimes they can be very spherical or round. Um, in the Cleveland Shale, they tend to be fairly um, flat and, and wide. So like I said, big pancakes. Concretions uh, usually form in sedimentary rocks when you have um, a small, Think of think of like almost think of it almost like a seed. So you could have something uh, like uh, a little uh, grain of of an iron rich mineral that tends to attract and accrete more iron around it, and then it grows out from there. Uh, I think they're flat ge generally just because they are in a horizontally bedded shale, so you're dealing with flat layers of rock. Um, although that's Sometimes, you know, usually I think in sandstones you get more rounded concretions and, and um, it's easier, I think, for um, concretions to grow and expand into a spherical shape when you have uh, the grain, space between the grains of sand well, and the cool. sandstone. But did, did you talk about the fact that it, it forms around something? Yeah, yeah. So in the case of the Cleveland Shale, the shark is sort of that seed and what Ashley mentioned earlier about urea in the system. Um, so there, we think there may have been an interaction with the urea and the shark and the hydrogen sulfide that was in the ancient sea mud on the seabed. Uh, the bottom of the ocean at the time was actually starved of oxygen. So it did not have coral reefs. It did not have- No an, crustaceans. Nothing was living on the seabed and it was barren and like the modern Black Sea. And so when these sharks fell down, um, and settled, there was nothing there to eat all that soft tissue. No crabs, and no like other worms, organisms. Yeah. yeah. So you take that and then you add the urea and maybe some weird bio and geochemical interactions and you essentially kind of pickle the sharks in place and as more mud that's rich in um, carbon settles down and buries them, 
you essentially can form that concretion um, around the shark, which as the rocks will bear down on top of the shark with more and more weight and pressure, as the mud continues to settle, everything gets kind of flattened out. And I think that's probably why you're seeing sort of this broad and flat concretion right. formation in the Cleveland Shale. So when we think about um, like going fossil hunting, um, you know, we go out here in the Rocky River looking for Dunkleosseus still to this day. And it's really exciting when you find um, a concretion because you never know what could be inside of it given they're really, really big. And so it's hard to actually get them, you know, you have to really want to get them back to the lab or try to crack them in the field. But um, you know that something could be inside, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. What kind of fish were around for it to eat? Do you want to take this one? There's, there's lots of, yeah. so yeah, so we talked about the diversity of the Devonian oceans. Uh, in the Cleveland Shale environment, we have um, dozens of species uh, of different placoderm or, or these, you know, um, armored fish. So you have uh, Dunkleosteus was big enough that jaws were strong enough they could crunch bone like you crunch a potato chip. And so there were lots of uh, things for it to eat, anything smaller than, than its mouth, basically. Um, potentially other Dunkleosteus, but Titanic bees, Heinzic bees, Organic bees, Fungardius, Hylonomus. And uh, it sounds like we're speaking Latin, we Polinius. are. <laughs> yeah, so these are just the, some of the armored fish. Yeah. And then you Take move a... into the sharks, you have uh, a few different species of Cladosalaki, and then you have the tunicanth sharks, like tunicanthus, and you have stepacanthus, sharks that had odd spikes and weird brushy things sticking out of their dorsal fins. Then you also had the paleoniscaforms, which are the little bony fish that were in various sizes. So, um, there were also aminoids in the ocean at the time too, but they, they don't preserve very well in the shale, but we do find bits and pieces of aminoids. Um, Actually, I have a plea out to any artists out there. If anybody here loves drawing, um, the Devonian fish really need some love. There's a lot of paleo artists who like drawing dinosaurs, but there's not a lot of paleo artists that are fond of drawing Dunkleosteus. I mean, Dunkleosteus is kind of um, I would say it's the most drawn of all, um, you know, Devonian fish, but there's Gorgonichthys, which is really hard to find any paleo art of, and it's even scarier than Dunkleosteus. Um, it's got these bladed teeth with serrations on the back, big spikes, um, and a big spike in the front, like a, like a saber tooth almost. Yeah, so, so imagine, imagine the front of uh, don't gloss his jaw, but instead of that big blade and fang, you have essentially a big Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth sized <laughs> yeah. fang at the front that, that sits into like a scabbard in yeah. the upper jaw. It's a giant stabby murder fish. So please send your drawings to these guys and share them with us because um, we need more love for the Devonian fish. All right, this one is prefaced with yes, they know they're from different time periods, but if a Mosasaur and a Dunkleosteus got into a fight. Who would win? Dunkleosteus. Lee can tell you why. Well, if, uh, <laughs> I guess it, in a lot of these cases, it depends on who can get their mouth on who first. And um, so a Mosasaur could probably deal no, a wait. lot of soft tissue this damage. This is going to be a Mosasaur, not the one from Jurassic World, because that one was like way too big. Yes. If it was Dunkleosteus versus that Mosasaur, that Mosasaur would win for right. sure. Right, there's no Mosasaur that that's ever exist. existed that, that, that big. Yeah. Um, so. The so regular sized Dunkleosteus, regular sized Mosasaur. I think a Mosasaur is more maneuverable, honestly. And if it, the thing is, is that, you know, it could probably bite off a fin or bite the tail or something, but I don't know. Dunkleosteus is going to get it in the end, though, because of the bite force. It's not going to be able to do any damage to the skull. I don't think a Mosasaur could crush a Dunkleosteus skull. And the Dunkleosteus, you know, can, can generate potentially up to like 20,000 PSI with his jaws. Like it's I said. way stronger than a Mosasaur. Yeah. yeah. The bite force and the bite cycle of Dunkleosteus is really interesting, and it's been calculated that the open and close speed of the jaws was something like 60 thousandths of a second, delivering several thousand pounds of force. Well, like faster than you can clap. Yeah. <laughs> so Dunkleosteus biting something, it would essentially look like a firework of <laughs> blood and bone in the water just exploding <laughs> with a tremendous 
clacking noise. I'm just going to be thinking about that all day now. Thank you for the visual. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine that. <laughs> you hear an explosion, you look, and there's just a red cloud and a mosasaur, yeah. two pieces falling down. I love mosasaurs, yeah. though. I think they're amazing. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <Jess. laughs> <laughs> oh, Dunkleosteus versus Megalodon. <laughs> There's, I mean, there's not much that's gonna win with yeah, Megalodon. It's, no, it's 50 feet long. It's so big. It's bigger than Dunkleosteus. So I'm gonna go with Megalodon on that one. Putting anything against Megalodon it's is really like hard. putting a toddler against a biker in a fight. <laughs> it's just, it's not a fair matchup. It's not fair. <laughs> Thank goodness they live years and years and years, millions of years apart. Did you oh, guys do a Mosasaur podcast? It sounds like we forgot to mention something. Why do we say Dunkleosteus oh, yeah. instead of Dunkleosteus? We have to end with this. So um, the name Dunkleosteus comes uh, from um, paleontologists who used to work at the Natural History Museum here in Cleveland named David Dunkel. David Dunkel worked on a lot of fossil fish from the Devonian. So Dunkleosteus was, Dunkleosteus was named in his honor. And so here in Cleveland, we say Dunkleosteus because of uh, the namesake of David Dunkel, our former like curator. Mispronouncing someone's last name if you say Dunkleosteus. So it does look like that though when it's yeah. spelled, it's just kind of funky. But you've heard it here first, or Maybe. you know, you heard it here. I mean, you heard it here. <laughs> I don't know if it's first, but it's yeah. Dunkleosteus. Thanks for so having us. for spending your morning with us and answering some great questions. Tomorrow's presentation is going to be slightly different. Uh, being April 1st and all, we're going to have a little bit of fun with that. It's going to be called the Joy of Paleo, and you guys need to make sure to bring your art supplies. Yes, this is Corax. Uh, your, <laughs> <laughs> your art supplies along with... Hi, Balls. Hi, Katie. Bye. <laughs> so if that means paper, pencil, markers, crayons, uh, you can do watercolors, whatever. We're going to be talking about a, a specific paleo topic and then drawing it. So we'll have a little bit of fun there. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for yeah, having us on. So much. Thanks so much for doing this, and, and thanks for everybody who attended and that, all the wonderful questions. And we're looking forward to seeing this tidal wave of Dunkleosteus Dunkle art. Dunkleosteus art. <laughs> <laughs> we will send it your way. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Have a great right. day, guys. Thank you.